Welcome everybody to episode 14 of our life group study of the book of Acts. I pray and trust that today will be a blessing to you. In the last episode, we looked at how the gospel was first taken to the Samaritans by Philip, who was one of the seven. And in fact, he's the only person in the Bible who was called an evangelist. In this episode, what we're going to do is just pick up from where we left off. And we're going to read Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 40. So what I'd like you to do is just pause the video, read that passage, Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 40. And then once you finish reading it, I'd like you just to answer the five questions that are going to come up on your screen. Just discuss them and answer them together. And then once you've done that, then come back and we will continue the Bible study looking at these five questions together. Well, welcome back. I hope that you had a good time of discussion and uh, that some uh, insight was received as each of you contributed. Let's just have a look at these questions and uh, uh, maybe there'll be some things that I come up with that maybe you didn't come up with. Maybe there's some things that you might have come up with that I won't come up with. But together, I think that we will contribute and add value. So let's look at the first question, which is the value of one person to God, considering the value of one person to God. Uh, what is that value? And we see from this story just how much God uh, places in terms of value on the salvation of just one person. Consider the lengths that God went to in order to bring the Ethiopian eunuch to saving faith in the Lord Jesus. I mean, first of all, he sent an angel from heaven. Uh, then we see he, he directed Philip, who was ministering to an entire city at that time, out onto an, an isolated desert road for just one person. I think that's a very striking thing to think about. Here is Philip in the city of Samaria with this incredible revival going on, and yet God takes him out of that revival and send him, sends him down this isolated desert road just for one person. And then we see... After that, once Philip has gone to that road and is walking down that road, that God then by his spirit helped Philip to know why he had been sent there and find uh, the one that God wanted him to share the gospel with. And so we see God's supernatural direction uh, being given to Philip in, in order for this one man to hear the gospel and so be saved. Keeping this in mind, I would like you just to consider the Lord's words in John chapter 6. Possibly you can just pause the video right now and just read John chapter 6 verse 37 to 40. And look particularly at verse 39, noticing the words that are written there, not one. Uh, these words tell us what Jesus' mission was when he came to earth. And it's still his mission now. So just read the, that passage, John chapter 6, verses 37 to 40, uh, looking particularly at verse 39. And then once you've done with that, then come back and I'll just add a few more comments about this particular passage. Well, welcome back. As you can see, Jesus' mission is expressed here in this passage and it is essentially not to lose one person that God has given to him and so the question I ask is do you think he's going to succeed in this mission or not at the end of it all will there be a single person whom the father has given to the Lord Jesus that is not saved if there is going to be just one such person then what it means is that Jesus has failed in the mission that God gave him. Because what did he say? He said God had, um, the will of God was that he would not lose one, not even one person that the Father had given to him. I, for one, do not believe that he's going to fail. I believe that the Lord Jesus is going to accomplish the will of the, of the Father perfectly. And the story of the eunuch, shows the lengths that he will go to in ensuring that every one of his lost sheep are found and brought into the fold. So that brings us to the second question or the second point that we were looking at today, which is the involvement of God in bringing people to salvation. We can see in this story that we've read in Acts chapter 8, 
just how involved God is in bringing people to hear and believe the gospel so they can be saved. Not only did he send an angel to Philip and direct Philip to the eunuch's chariot, but he had evidently also been working deeply in the eunuch's life well before this ever happened. And that's something that we need to think about. He had caused, that's God had caused the eunuch to hear about him uh, long before this ever happened. Remember that Ethiopians are not Jews. So somehow God had led this man to embrace the Jewish God and faith. Now we don't obviously know how this had happened, but we, we do know that he had been in Jerusalem and that he had obtained a copy of the Jewish scriptures, which we would refer to as the Old Testament. And very possibly he had even become a gentle proselyte of Judaism. So maybe it was his service of, of Candace, the Ethiopian queen that had led him to Jerusalem and caused him to be exposed to the Jewish faith. We don't really know, but it could possibly, very possibly have been that. However, what we do know is that we can see that God had arranged uh, the circumstances of his life in such a way that he would be brought to this place where he would be able to hear the gospel. And not only so, we can see that God had been working in his heart in preparation for him to hear the gospel and believe it and thus be saved. So what does this teach us? Even though the Lord has left the church with the task of preaching the gospel and making disciples, he is still very much involved in the whole matter. The Lord Jesus didn't go back into heaven and sit at the right hand of God just to wait for us to do what he has told us to do in our own power and wisdom. He's intimately involved even now in the salvation of every person who is ever saved. He is intimately involved in directing the work of the church and ensuring that the gospel reaches the ears of all who will be saved. Even as he is simultaneously also involved in preparing their hearts to receive the gospel. And so this is why the Lord gave the Great Commission to the apostles. And when he did so, he said to them that he would be with them as they went out in obedience to his commands. If we just were to read Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 to 20, we will see that at the very end of the Great Commission, the Lord said to the apostles, I am going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. He said that he would be with them as they went out in obedience to the Great Commission. And in doing so, he was saying that they would, they would not be doing it alone. He was saying that he would be involved. And this is exactly what we see in the account of Philip and the eunuch. Consider now what all this means to us in terms of the salvation of people we have a burden for. Does this not explain why we need to be praying for unsaved people that we are burdened for? Also notice how God, uh, how involved God was in placing Philip in the exact place where he wanted them at the exact time he wanted him to preach the gospel. And not only did he send an angel to direct him to the eunuch, but we see at the very end of this passage that he also transported him miraculously by the Spirit to the next cities that he wanted him to preach in. Just think of that. When we consider this passage, we see just how much God is involved in reaching His people, reaching His elect with the gospel. This brings us to the next point, which is all about the message of the gospel. The eunuch was reading from Isaiah 53. God had, di had directed him to this exact passage at that very moment Philip arrived. So we can see in this the, the, the preciseness of the timing of God in it all, right down to the very minute. What was the eunuch reading? He was reading a prophecy about Jesus, a prophecy given by Isaiah approximately 700 years before Jesus was even born. A prophecy that foretold his earthly life, death, burial and resurrection in the most amazing way. The problem is, is that the eunuch had no idea who Isaiah was prophesying about. And that's why God brought Philip to him. Philip knew who Isaiah was talking about. He was talking about Jesus. And so what did Philip do? He told the eunuch about Jesus. Do you know that this is what evangelism is all about? It is telling people about Jesus, who he is, what he did, why he did it, and what it all means for us today. In telling the eunuch about Jesus, Philip was sharing the gospel with him. 
The gospel is simply the message about Jesus, what he's done and what it means to us. That's it. And if you tell people who Jesus is, what he's done and what it means to us, you are sharing the gospel with him. It's that simple. It's not complicated. And anyone who believes that simple message are the ones that God says are going to be saved. Let's move on and look now at the next point, which we, uh, I asked you to look at, which is the role of angels in the salvation of God's elect. We see that God sent an angel to Philip to command him to leave the work in Samaria and go along the desert road to Gaza. While God uses angels at times, amongst other things, to communicate his will to those who preach the gospel, what we need to understand is that he does not use them to preach the gospel. God didn't send the angel with the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. He sent Philip. And as I said, this is very important for us to understand. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 4, it says this, that angels are all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who will inherit salvation. They, those who inherit salvation, in other words, God's elect. What I'd like you to do is just pause the video now and just read Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Luke 15, verses 1 to 10. And as you read it, just consider that Jesus is talking here about his lost sheep. And he's talking here and mentions also angels in connection with the salvation of his lost sheep. So just read this passage, Luke chapter 15, verse 1 to 10, just bearing these few points in mind. I hope you can see there how Jesus mentions angels when it comes to the salvation of God's elect. And he says that they rejoice. There's great rejoicing amongst the angels when just one person repents. Once again, we see this whole idea of the importance of just one. Why? Because Jesus has come to do the will of the Father, and that is that not one of those that he's given to the Lord, not one of his lost sheep should be lost and remain lost, but should be found and be saved. And angels are very involved in this process this matter of saving God's elect. And they are very aware of when even just one of God's elect, one of the Lord Jesus' sheep, lost sheep, is saved. They're not permitted to preach the gospel to them because that is the church's domain. The task of preaching the gospel has been given to the church, not to the angels. And we will see this point even more clearly shown when we come again to Acts chapter 10. This brings me to ask a question. Are we as a church taking this role, the role of preaching the gospel, as seriously as we should? When you consider just the involvement of God in this whole matter, even to the point of angels being involved, even to the point of angels rejoicing when one, just one of the Lord Jesus' lost sheep comes to salvation, are we taking this matter as seriously as we should? I'd like you just to pause the video and just to consider that question together. And then once you're done, come back and we'll continue. Well, welcome back. Let's look at the last question, the last point that we raised. The place of baptism in a person's acceptance of the gospel. Notice just how keen the eunuch was to be baptized. They were traveling through a very arid place. And as you know, water is not readily available in such places. However, as soon as the eunuch saw some water, enough water for him to be baptized in, he asked Philip immediately to baptize him. Why? Why was he so keen to be baptized? How did he even know that he needed to be baptized? Well, obviously, Philip had told him that he needed to be baptized. You see, in the apostles' teaching and methodology, baptism was not something that was optional. To them, baptism was the sign that someone had accepted the gospel and come to faith in Jesus. I'd like you just to cast your minds back to the day of Pentecost. And as you do so, just pause the video and just read together Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 41. 
and uh, just read it bearing in mind that we're talking here about the place of baptism in the a person's acceptance of the gospel. Once you're done reading it and uh, just thinking about it, then come back and we will finish off this study together. Welcome back. Uh, notice how Peter included baptism in his instructions to those who asked what they should do in response to the gospel. Notice how Luke says that those who accepted the gospel were baptized. How did the apostles judge who had and who hadn't accepted the gospel? Those who came forward to be baptized were judged to have accepted the gospel, and those who didn't come forward to be baptized were judged to have not accepted it. This tells us that the apostles considered people submitting themselves to baptism to be the evidence that they had believed the gospel and come to faith in Jesus. Anyone who did not do so was considered to have rejected the gospel. Could we not say that in some ways the church of today has lost sight of this truth? Maybe as we come to a close in this study today, you could just discuss that particular question together before you end uh, your meeting and your study. It's been wonderful to be with you today, and I pray that you've got some insights and just seen something concerning the importance that God places on the salvation of His people and just how involved He is in that process and that you've been challenged in terms of your commitment and our commitment as a church to this incredible mission that God is on, that He is busy and, and occupied with in the world, that of saving His people. God bless you.